Hi, Donna. There she is. Hi, Angela. Hi, Hi there. We have um, a few people waiting on the call already. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. How are you today? Good. <laughs> I was going to go sit outside, but it's kind of a cool day. Yeah, it is. Here, too. Here, too. So maybe what we'll do, we'll just give it a few more minutes because we're not quite at the 10 o'clock mark. Oh, yeah. We're early. Yeah. I'm just turning on my keynote. Great. Um, Oops. So one thing I wanted to mention is we had a few people um, that wanted to come on the call that also have um, some internet issues, <laughs> which as we know happens. Um, and so they wanted me to send the slides ahead of time, which we can't do. Um, but maybe if we could just sort of describe what you are talking about, that will help the people who are calling in on audio. Sure, can do that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's not common anyways for, um, it's just not common to, sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once here. That's okay. <laughs> uh, it's not common to give the slides because, God, you could change them a million more times before. But if you wanted to post them, like that's why I was saying we could maybe post them on, um, you could post it on YouTube or something. Well, the truth is, we, we will be um, doing that. We'll be posting the recording of today's workshop. So that, that right. will go on um, Just, Vimeo, YouTube, you know, we'll, we'll make it available. As long as my name is Angela, so I'm changing it to Donna. <laughs> Well, you know what the funny thing is? I don't know if you can see, but there's several Angela Drakes, which is um, very interesting. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> you know what? And also it said, well, this is canceling your other Zoom. Now that you've signed on with Angela, I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I'll just <laughs> re-Zoom it whenever I need it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what's going on, Angela. You got a magic system going there. Everybody's Angela. Yeah, no kidding. Well, we had quite a windstorm the other day, so I was praying that my internet was going to work today because, of course, I'm um, zooming from home this morning. So, so far, so good. I know. I I was on Cortez Island taking that course, functional, anything on Cortez Island on Hollyhock. If you can take any course, it's like a retreat. It's unbelievable because there's very little internet. It's really sketchy. Mm -hmm. But the courses are fantastic, and you're walking from the breakfast, like you go, you start with yoga, then you walk down to breakfast, then you walk up to the sessions, then you walk down for lunch, like you're always walking outside in between. It's really nice. Yeah, that's wonderful. Oh, Angela Drake is connecting already. <laughs> <laughs> I see I'm following you. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Oh, Angela, you. you are propagating like crazy. <laughs> that's so strange. And you're BCG. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to worry about it. We're just going to yeah. do what we need to do here today. Exactly. Um, so maybe so, I will know, say... I made the slides. Sorry, how much time do you want all together? Um, Close to an hour? We, we advertised it as an hour. Okay. Um, so I think that that would be great to um, try and keep to that. Um, and you know what? We've got quite a few people here. Um, yeah, yeah, so we could start. Yeah, I just wanted to maybe do some, hi everyone, <laughs> I'm Angela Drake. <laughs> maybe lots of you are too, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> um, I am the marketing director with BC Greenhouse Builders. You've probably seen my name. I'm the one who sends out all of those emails. Um, and uh, hopefully they've been helpful for you. <laughs> um, so a few just uh, housekeeping things today. Um, we are really going to try and um, manage the questions through the chat feature. The last time we did a workshop, there was a lot of sort of anecdotal stuff that was happening and it ended up lengthening the workshop quite a bit. So um, this is still relatively new for us. So um, I'll be asking for feedback at, um, you know, next week and, and feel free to let me know how you liked it, how we can do things better, because ultimately this workshop is for you. 
We want you to um, maximize and have successful greenhouse growing operation in whatever uh, way that you're doing that. Um, as you know, lots of people use greenhouses for lots of different things. So um, Donna Balzer, of course, is our brand ambassador and, and our guest speaker today. And Donna, thank you so much for taking the time. I know it was a bit tight coming back from your retreat. So we certainly appreciate that. Um, I would just, one last housekeeping thing, if people can keep their um, recordings muted, that would be wonderful. Um, if you do have a question down in the bottom, you'll see um, the chat. And so in the chat, you just um, type your message, type your question down on the right hand side. And uh, we will all be sort of helping Donna to moderate and um, pushing the questions up and uh, getting them answered. So um, Donna, I'll let you officially introduce yourself and we'll go from there. Okay, well, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. I was hoping to be outside, but it's just not that kind of a day today. So I was hoping to be up in my greenhouse. I see we've got at least one person in our greenhouse, another Angela Drake. <laughs> also due to some reason, which we don't know, a lot of us, including me, we're called Angela when we started. So if you wanna change your name, you just go up to the three little, or you just click on the name and it'll ask, you can change your name. Anyway, I have been greenhouse growing both in Alberta and now in BC. And if you're from the States, you might not know where that is, but I've been in a couple of different climates. And I would say, you know, even this year, I've learned some things. So there's no way you're ever done learning. I would say this greenhouse is the best for brain health. People say it's Sudoku. I'm sure it's your greenhouse because there's always something happening and always something different. So Angela's idea was that we would get together in the fall because there's specific problems to the fall. I'm going to refer a bit back to summer first and then we'll launch into fall. And then of course, uh, anytime when something pops up, you can, as Angela said, put it in the chat. And then she'll try to group them. So if four people want to know about arugula or something, then she'll say, look, Donna, four people asked, what are we going to do? So we'll move on from there. Uh, although I love the questions and we will hopefully have time for that at the end too. So I have made, um, I'm going to share my screen. Then is that what I'm going to do, Angela? Oh, Angela's muted. Yeah, you should be able to... Um... And the host has disabled the participant screening. So you have disabled that. So I won't be sharing my screen. Um, Hold on one second. I'll just be looking cute here. Uh, so uh, just to show, I guess we haven't got a show of hands because a lot of people aren't live. I've only got a couple of people whose images are up. If your image is up, um, I guess how many people are from Canada? of the two of you, three of you, lots of Angela's, one, one person <laughs> from Canada, and the other two are from the States. Okay, well then when we talk about, and I'll just refer to that now, because when I was driving back, I was just at a retreat for a week, and when I was driving back, um, when I was driving back from that, I crossed through a town called Campbell River, and it said it was at the 50th latitude, and I, I did not know I was that close. So I'm an hour south of the 50th latitude. And of course, being in Canada, we're above the 49th parallel. So you can look that up. It's pretty easy to look up where you're at. Once you Google what's my day length in my latitude, you're going to find out, um, like for me on October, I'm close to the 50th latitude, uh, 50th parallel. Uh, when I, on October 10th, 12th, I get down to less than 10 hours a day of light getting into my greenhouse. And that's really critical for greenhouses. And I see Marianne is nodding her head. I don't know if you're in the same parallel or not, but you really have a sudden drop and it's not so dramatic in other areas. So I'm going to try again to share the screen, see if Angela's changed that. Um, I believe I did. Let's, fingers crossed. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. There you go. Oops. You are sharing your screen. There we go. And I should still be on the far corner so that I can still make eye contact with people. Yes, All you right. are, Donna. For some reason, I've got that big tag in the middle of my... Uh, my screen, but let's just try to ignore that. 
Anyway, I'm not just a brand ambassador for BC Greenhouse. I should start with that. I'm also a horticulturist. I'm trained as a gardener and lots of years of writing and speaking. So basically, uh, I don't always talk about greenhouses. Sometimes I talk about other things, but usually it's about food. So I thought we'd talk today about functional gardening and how we're going to kind of go from late summer into fall. Functional gardening, I spent a lot of years, if you're from Canada, you'll know the CBC, it's our national public radio. And for years and years and years, I answered questions. So people would want a five second question to a 10 minute problem, and maybe it was a 20 minute problem. And you've probably experienced this when you go to your doctor, you go in and they say, only bring one question each time. And then of course you, you can't really describe why you've got something going on there and it's complicated and it's the same with plants it can be complicated so we can't answer all questions but i know that one of the things that was really common again this summer and it's been i had a call from victoria and victoria is considered the garden city of canada i don't know if you all know where that is but it's actually down below the 49th parallel and it's across from almost across from seattle and I had people phoning me from Victoria, the garden city of Canada, saying they could not grow zucchini. And so just a little refresher here, the female flowers always have a tiny little zucchini on them. The male flowers always have this long, thin stalk. And you have to have both the males and the females. That's just the way the, the world works. You have to have both. And so I suggested that when her flowers are open, she just transferred pollen from the male to the female. And that was my friend in Victoria. But again, I've heard this this summer from so many people. So I just want to wanted to bring that up. If you don't want to be the bee, if you don't want to have to work that hard, the best thing is flowers. And people think, oh, flowers are good for our psyche. Flowers are good for, you know, there's lots of things flowers are good for, but they're really good for the bees. And it's the bees that we need to avoid all this hand pollinating that goes on. And just uh, for your reference, there's hundreds of kinds of bees. So often when I use the word bee, people think, oh, honeybee. Oh yeah, no, we don't have any honeybees. Well, no, there's bumblebees and there's hoverflies and there's little, little bees, hundreds and hundreds of kinds of bees. So lots of them are solitary. Some of them are grouped in a hive like a wasp. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of different kinds of bees. So just attract more bees, put things in that are more colorful. I loved this. I just wanted to show this one slide. I was walking downtown. I live in a small town and the gardeners had put this around a little city building, which is kind of a stream around a city building, to put something so nice, but they had put this beautiful a collection of flowers together in their hanging baskets around their buildings. And so I had to phone the town and ask, and it's called Pop the Bubbly. I think it's a proven winners uh, combination, but sometimes you don't have to be creative and inventive yourself. You can just, you know, use them. So for the people that are on um, on their phone, Pop the Bubbly is uh, a yellow, a white petunia with a yellow center. And I noticed yellow petunias. There's something that's changed with the genetics, and yellow petunias are becoming more popular. So it's white, but it has a yellow center. There's some bright yellow biddens and some other, oh, let me see, there's some coral colored begonias, so really pretty. Oh, and I had my just, oops, I guess I can't go back, went back twice. I had my Cupid mix zinnias, and I ordered the Cupid mix because most of the mixed zinnias were, oh, maybe 75 centimeters or two and a half feet tall, and it was just too big for me. And so I tried the Cupid mix, which was super cute, but I ended up falling, falling in love with the tall ones. So there you go. So functional gardening is about climate change too. We're all going to be faced with this. It happened this summer. We had that heat dome that descended all across North America. And that's part of climate change. And we're going to have this erratic. I had, I was just away for a week and I had two inches of rain while I was away that was five centimeters and the week before we had three inches of rain so this is five inches of rain in one month that is a lot of rain regardless of where you live and so that's changing the humidity and that's part of climate change it's it's really true but it also means we're going to have a few opportunities opening up if you're looking at this slide you're seeing my lemon and so it's pretty unusual to be able to grow a lemon tree, but being on the West Coast with a little bit of innovation, uh, i.e. greenhouses, 
I've been able to grow lemons and we had over 125 lemons last year. So that was pretty exciting. And so I guess that would be the bo bonus of climate change uh, because we are getting milder winters. Although I've had people telling me we're getting more snow, but I don't know. Um, also lots of kinds of cucumbers. So that was on the other side of the picture. So the best thing you can do for this is you can write down in your own journal. I have a journal, BC Greenhouses sells it as well. It's going to ask you, it's, it's a three-year journal, so it's going to ask you, um, and you're going to write down for three years on the same date. And it's interesting how you can see patterns or changes. I once had a period where I had four months without a drop of rain out here. So it's good to write it down. If you've got a just a blank journal, that works too, but draw a line so that you can compare for five years or three years. I know Lee Valley Tools has a kind of um, has a giant journal. It's something you wouldn't be able to take outside with you. It's giant for 10 years. So again, it's really important to track because things are changing. We know that with global warming. The other thing we can help ourselves with global warming is that we can um, just grow more in our greenhouses because in the greenhouse, you're more in control of the climate. And that's something that I love. So I just put up a little picture here for anyone that's missing that of my greenhouse, which is the Pacific series. It's dark green and it is 16 by 20. I had a smaller eight by 12, but I really felt I deserved a bigger greenhouse. So sometimes you can't do all the things in a small greenhouse that I might be doing in a big greenhouse because uh, you'll just run out of space. You won't be able to have five of everything. You'll be running out of space. So you will have to make choices. But I just wanted to let you know, I do have a 16 by 20 and that's how Angela found me. And that's how I became the brand ambassador because I have such a big greenhouse. So today, this is just our real official welcome slide, BC Greenhouse Builders, October 2nd, 2021. A healthy garden is a happy gardener. And I really believe in that. If you're always fussing and worrying about things and concerned, you're not going to be um, on your game with your garden. It's not going to be a functional garden. And in your greenhouse, as in your regular garden and I'm sure most of us that have greenhouses also have a little garden space outside it's all really about the soil so if you are growing in pots and you're buying new soil every year then you're going to be depending on the purchased soil and fertilizers to keep your plants looking good so you're going to have different kinds of questions than people that are trying to build their soil and building your soil is uh, a process you're never quite there I think it's like building your health. You're, you're just always working on it. So your, your garden is only as good as your soil. I just put up a slide here of uh, cauliflowers called Susanna. Susanna is one that we've I've grown for probably 10 years now, but I keep growing it. I've got some out in the green, out in, outside now, actually. I decided to try it outside because of global warming. We were getting a longer period without frost. And last year I had some in the greenhouse that were... Uh, they were ready by uh, sort of just before Christmas. And that was pretty exciting. But when you have bad soil and you're trying to grow cauliflowers, you just get those little tiny guys that are only an inch across. And you're like, ah, what's going on? And, and so it's all about the soil. So there's a few points here. So this is a little more content uh, intense. So this is just a little photo inside my greenhouse of my radishes, just cherry bell radishes, nothing special. But you'll see the soil in this picture and how it's all gripping to that little, those little uh, radical roots that are growing off the bottom. And so first step is just in your functional garden, just be proactive in your garden. So go out and look for things. Don't be a nervous Nelly. Don't be always worried about everything. I've had people with or ordinary garden variety spiders phone me and say, is this spider mites? No, it's got a big pattern of spider. It's just a spider and spiders are good. Spiders help you to catch things that are, are there in the greenhouse, and they're your friend. Now, ever since I've moved to the coast, we have spiders that are almost the big, as big as your, as big as you can make a circle with, like bigger than a quarter, bigger than a toonie. And so now I've been <clears throat> wearing gloves a lot more in my greenhouse. But be proactive, look for things, look around. Also, uh, make your own compost. Yes, you can buy compost. Uh, that's something that's for sale, but you'll find a lot of times on the bags of compost, it'll say sterilized or, um, you know, it'll basically just say it's lifeless. 
And the whole reason we use compost is because it's so good for our soils. It's just so good. It's good for our gardens. I was just reading a really interesting book about forestry and about trees. It doesn't seem like that would be that interesting. But uh, the, the lady that wrote it, Suzanne Smart, is a researcher at UBC, and her work has now been quoted internationally because before she started her work, she had grown up in the forest with her family. They had always had lots of wood to cut, but once the forestry company started cutting down the trees entirely and then cleaning the sites, spraying everything to clean everything, and then replanting little seedlings into the sterile situation, they found they were dying almost right away. And it's the same in your garden. If you try to keep it too clean, if you try to just absolutely have everything gone, and especially using things like sterilized or um, compost, it's going to be a problem. So that plays along with worms. Point three was employ worms or at least worm castings. And again, when you buy those worms or worm castings, don't, um, don't buy the sterilized ones. You want to make sure that you are having living worm castings and they can contain, and we're going to get into that a bit more, they contain quite a bit. You'll also want to cover your soil with mulch. And this is really applicable even inside your greenhouse. This year with that heat dome, we were getting so much heat. The soil temperatures were getting so high. Plants aren't used to having high soil temperatures. They're okay with high air temperatures, but they don't want high soil temperatures. The only thing you can do to cool down the soil, it seems counterproductive, but putting a layer, a blanket of something else on top of your existing soil. So if you're growing in pots, or you're growing in the soil, uh, putting something on the top to cool it down. And I, this year I used a product called Sea Soil, but I just put an inch of it on top. It just helps to cool down. People do think mulch generally warms the soil, but that's, it, that's not true. Mulch generally cools the soil. So if we keep getting heat domes, we're gonna have to keep adding, um, we're gonna have to keep adding mulch on our greenhouse. I also say that a good functional garden will have a cover crop. So I didn't do that last year, but I'm off to the garden center right after we're done here. I'm gonna buy some cover crops. And I've used, two years ago, I put in fall rye in my greenhouse. So I just chose a year. And I think I'm gonna do this about every four years or maybe every three years. This year being an exceptionally hot, strange year, I, I'm gonna do it again this year. I'm gonna be flexible. And that's another thing about your gardening. You have to be flexible. So I'm going to cover that, um, that soil this fall. I'm going to do it probably next week. Last year I did the left, or two years ago, I did the left side. This time I'm going to do the right side. It's just a, how I split things up. And I'm going to use fall rye, but you can also use oats or barley, or you could use buckwheat. There's other things for sale. So when you get to your garden center, you'll see they'll have big bags of cover crops. And that's just something, even if you're growing in pots and you want to keep using the same soil, you don't want to have to throw it out every year because now, of course, we're all aware of peat moss, which is our number one source of potting mix is almost, you know, they're starting to run out. So we want to maybe use that soil again. So maybe you'll grow in your pots after you take out your peppers, maybe you'll put in some, a cover crop like a, like a fall rye. And we also want to add beneficial bugs. Sometimes these bugs come in by themselves, sometimes you have to bring them in and there's lots of sources for those so we're going to talk about that a bit more so if you are missing uh <clears throat> if you are missing uh, the slides you're missing my little four-year-old grandson who's holding this two pound tomato and it's called ananas and noir tomato and it was a new seed. Somebody suggested it to me. They really wanted me to try it. They know I love tomatoes. And I did have 43 kinds of tomatoes this year. So this is a little uh, Arlo holding that tomato. And because the screen's in front of my text, I can't read the text, but that's OK. Here's a little video of that tomato. So what a huge, huge tomato. This is a Nanus Noir. Beautiful on the inside, gorgeous coloring, nice and ripe and luscious. Oh, what a huge central core. I just hate that. It's just all woody inside and lots and lots of cracking. All the tomatoes were cracked this year. So even though it's a huge producer, really lovely flavor. I don't think I'm going to grow this one again. 
Okay, that was a Nanus Noir. That was a new one for me. It had that big central core. And if you don't know what I mean by that, if you can't, what I mean is you cannot, if you cannot slice these large tomatoes just evenly into beautiful luscious slices, you have to cut out that big core first, that central core around the stem. That's not a good thing. Also, an Anis Noir had that cracking in the top and they all had the cracking. And so I don't think it was me because I had so many tomatoes that were excellent. And that's the best idea. If you can grow so many kinds of tomatoes, then you'll know which ones grow best for you because we're all different. So just running through the season, I had something I always dream of, and I always try to order at restaurants, spinach salad with uh, strawberries, but I've never been able to grow my spinach at the same time of my strawberries, because the spinach is a cool crop and it starts to go bolting, it starts to go to seed by the time the strawberries are coming on. But this year, because I was growing strawberries in my eaves troughs, and my spinach was planted this time last year, so it was still producing by May so I was able to have spinach salad. So that was a huge win for me this season. I also have lots of really amazing, good season, uh, sort of midsummer meals, lots and lots of uh, basil. This year I switched over to Eleonora basil. And if you're not already growing the downy mildew free basils, just write downy mildew free. So when you order your basil seed, Eleonora is just one of many kinds. There was many years of breeding Everyone was finding their basil was dying. It was dying earlier than they wanted. Some of you have maybe even bought a greenhouse because you thought I'm gonna finally grow good basil. And then you plant it in your greenhouse and you'll find it's getting brown patches and looking bad. That's the downy mildew. And so DM, DMV or whatever, downy mildew free DMF, uh, you can find varieties of basil that are now downy mildew free. So I was off to the races this year and we have had so much amazing basil. Also zucchinis, we did not have a problem with pollination because we do have a lot of flowers here. I always grow an early crop of zucchinis in my greenhouse. So when I plant my tomatoes, again, remember I have a big space. When I plant my tomatoes, I leave a gap for maybe one or two zucchini plants. And by the time they're producing outside in July, then I pull out those zucchini plants in my greenhouse. So I. I could leave them, but who needs that much zucchini? I do it so that I can have zucchini a good six weeks before I'm getting it outside. I really love a zucchini and I love making all kinds of recipes like the zucchini patties. And of course, with a, a really good greenhouse, you're gonna have more than you can eat. So you can give a lot of it away. Uh, my funniest thing was when I would pile all my tomatoes up in little containers and leave them outside my gate because I just couldn't deal with all the extra and I would just say tomatoes free and I had a guy come by oh maybe two weeks after I first did that because I was growing hamlet tomatoes and they were described as the best commercial breed of tomato you could ever hope to find they were even they were uniform they were just like the tomatoes you would buy at the store and I they just had me in hook line and sinker I was right there I wanted those hamlet tomatoes so I had planted those and they did produce like crazy. I had so many tomatoes, I didn't know what to do with them. So I put them in these little boxes. I actually bought a box of the little cardboard boxes and I put them outside and I put out 10 or more kind, um, trays each day and just was giving them away. So a fellow came by and he said, hey, are you, I was just a side yard, but he could see through the fence. Are you, are you the lady with the tomatoes? Are you, were you giving away tomatoes? And I said, yeah, yeah, that's me. And he said, um, I just want to tell you, those were the worst tomatoes I've ever had. And I was like, ah! And of course, that's why I was putting them out, because they were the worst tomatoes. They looked beautiful. They were supermarket quality. They were all the same. And the name is Hamlet. I had paid $12.95 for 10 seeds. My daughter saw that. And she just freaked out. Mom, you paid $12 for seeds. I said, I know. The description was so good. But again, that's the big difference between home gardening and grocery store shopping for food. Your food from the grocery store often has no flavor. That's how they're able to ship them around the countryside. That's how they're able to supply to all the chains. So yeah, they were homegrown, but they were terrible. And I've never grown, um, I've never grown Hamlet since then. And it was kind of funny because I already knew it, but it was funny that someone that got free tomatoes dropped by. 
So functional gardener will be anticipating problems. And if you've grown tomatoes before, you've maybe had this problem. So I'm just gonna point it out. When you turn the tomato over, so the part that's the stem end is where the little leaves are coming out and where the stem is attached. The other side is the blossom end. So that's where the blossom falls off. And sometimes you get a slight sunken area there, a little bit brown. Sometimes it turns really big and really brown. And that is called blossom end rot. So most of us will see that occasionally. And when we see it, when you see blossom end rot, most, if you are able to go to your garden center and complain, or if you're able to go on an online forum, or you're talking to people about it, most people will blame it on a lack of calcium. And it's like sipping through a straw. The calcium might be there in the soil, um, but your plants can't get it. So it's really usually not a lack of calcium. Although I always add calcium, it's always part of my fertilizer mix when I do that in the spring. But don't blame yourself. Don't blame your fertilizer. Some people will then, you know, just think, oh, I've got this problem now. So now I have to add calcium. Really, you should be adding that in the spring. That's a sort of a spring thing. You do all of your amending in the spring. Uh, the other thing is, is that when you're low on calcium, it's not that the soil levels are low on calcium. It's that you haven't been watering evenly. And again, because that when you don't water evenly, you end up with a situation where um, if you were sucking through a straw, which I was saying earlier, and there's lots of milkshake, you just get an even sucking sound. But when there's hardly any milkshake left and hardly any water left in your soil, hardly any milkshake left in your, in your cup and you're sucking, you're hearing air and those air caps makes a big slurping sound. And when this situation happens in your greenhouse or in your pots outside, you will not get an even flow of calcium because calcium has trouble moving around. Nitrogen, oh, sorry, that was my daughter phoning me. I had, I told her to call afternoon, but there you go. Anyway, um, when you've got the problem with nitrogen, you just can spray it right on the leaves and your plants are fine by tomorrow. But if you've got the problem of calcium shortage in your soil, it's because of not even, not evenly watering. Anyway, so some of you will be tempted to throw away your tomatoes because they look so bad. And some of you will blame yourself. Oh, I could never grow tomatoes. I'm so bad at growing tomatoes. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of a, a funny thing. I'm going to have to put my phone on um, sleep, which I should have done before. Anyway, there you go. That's what you're going to do. You're going to blame yourself because, of course, you are your gardener. You're trying to be perfect. So I just wanted to show you another picture of the Golden Delight tomatoes. Now, Golden Delight was a new variety for me this year. I grew them because they are heirloom tomatoes. They come true from seed. And I'm getting tired of spending $12.95 for seeds. I don't want to do that anymore. So I got these from a small supplier on Gabriola Island. So I'm on an island. They're on an even smaller island. And they sold, um, Sal sold me the seed. And the Golden Delight tomatoes in the greenhouse, as you can see, they're a beautiful delight. If you're not seeing, I'm sorry, but they're the two larger tomatoes that are virtually perfect on the top of the screen. The ones on the bottom are smaller. They have blossom end rot. I turned one over so that you could, they both had blossom end rot, but I wanted you to see the, just the size comparison. So the Golden Delight tomatoes grown outside because of that heat dome, it was hot and cold and windy and the soil and the water was drying out so fast. Sometimes I had to water three times a day. Whereas in the greenhouse, I put my shade cloth on. It was actually cooler some days in the greenhouse than outside. So those golden, uh, golden delight tomatoes were a delight. They were super sweet, didn't have any acidity, which some people don't like, but I, I thought they were beautiful. I've saved some seeds for next year. So back to that then with the, uh, the whole functional gardening share, make sure, sure your soils are healthy. Water more evenly. If you do that, you will not have blossom end rot. I had no blossom end rot in my greenhouse this year. So I had added calcium in the spring and I just bought like Calpril, C-A-L-P-R-I-L. It's um, separate from my other fertilizers because calcium is low in the area that I live. I live in an area with sandy soils. When I used to live in Calgary, there was a lot of clay, there was a lot of calcium in the soil, but here, and so you get to know your soils and I knew that I was low. So I always add Calpril in the spring, you just 
broadcast it on. I used to add, you know, they sell those big dusty dry bags of dolomitic lime and agricultural lime. And if it's windy and you open that bag, you've breathed in a whole bunch of dust. So I've stay away from all those dusty, dusty limes now. And I, when I'm growing tomatoes, I actually just use the Calpro, which is a brand, I guess it's organically certified. So I'm happy with that. And that's what I use. I don't have to deal with the dust. But while we're on that topic, I'll tell you about, basically we have ag lime and we have dolomite lime. Dolomite lime has a lot of magnesium in it and some people need that magnesium. And same with us in our human health. I just took this course on this. Some of us are low in magnesium, we need it. But if you've got a heavy clay soil, if you've got a soil with a lot of clay, magnesium will make your clay tight. And then when you try to dig in, it'll just be so hard, you'll hardly be able to dig in. So if you've got a clay soil, don't use dolomite, just use agricultural lime. You can always find another way to add magnesium. You can buy a fertilizer that contains it, or you can buy magnesium sulfate, which is just Epsom salts, and you can put that on. So do not, um, do not buy dolomitic lime if you have a clay soil. Sorry, I didn't even mean to say that, but there we went there. So you have to meet your plant needs and we know tomatoes, and I just talk about tomatoes because everyone loves them, I love them. But finally be flexible and adapt. If things aren't looking good, if you have tried 10 years in a row to grow, for instance, Gold Delight tomato, and they always have this, maybe it's not you, maybe it's the type of tomato. But I have to say this year, there was such a marked difference. I didn't have every tomato in the greenhouse as well as outside, but that's one of the ones and it was a huge difference in size and in blossom end raw. Okay, so <laughs> this is just a funny little photo, but I wanted to show you. As gardeners, we have to use every tool in our toolbox. This is the back of my greenhouse. It's got double doors on the back. We have a little paved area where I grow plants in pots. I just love growing plants. I'm sorry, Emma connected to that. So I, I read online about a fellow that rented out ducks. So you paid him a, an amount and he came to your house and he brought ducks for your garden. And I was a little nervous about this because I've seen how chickens are in the gardens and they claw and they throw up a lot of dirt. And generally most gardeners wouldn't want their chickens out wild in their gardens. And nobody I know would want their chickens in the greenhouse because they do this thing of digging and clawing. They're looking to get bugs. They do eat a lot of bugs, but they do a lot of digging. So this is the, the other one was a picture of just the ducks heading into the greenhouse. And this is the ducks in the greenhouse. And they were in the greenhouse for an hour eating bugs. What an exciting thing. So I have this, um, just a dirt floor. We, we, we weren't sure at first what we wanted in our greenhouse. So we just have a dirt floor, but we have these two beds, one on each side and two square planters in the middle to take up the rest of the space. So this is one of the sides and we have the um, cement uh, wall so we don't have to worry about too many bugs in there but surprisingly we kept these we kept these du ducks busy for almost an hour so one of the tools in my toolbox I'm is on my high list of things to get is get my own ducks but my husband is saying no no and no and these are called the Indian runner ducks or at least they're bred with those and so if you're interested in hearing more about the ducks I actually did a podcast about the ducks I interviewed uh, the fellow Cam who had the ducks. And what I liked about them is that they never dig. See how big and flat their feet are? They don't dig. So they use their bills to sort of push the soil around a bit and they gobble up all of those, well, everything you might have, mostly the big guys. Uh, huh, my brain, I've lost that one. But you know what I mean, the little guys that look like armadillos in your soil. Okay, so that is, I just want to repeat, if you haven't got it, if you've never grown flowers in your greenhouse, it's a good idea to grow some flowers in your greenhouse. I always grow flowers outside, and this is because they attract beneficial bugs. I'm sorry if you don't have the, I'm sorry if you don't have the video, but this is a small video. See that small fly on the side? That's called a hover fly. Okay, here he comes. And I wanted to show this video because you can see him hovering. It's like a helicopter, and it's, Although they look like a small wasp, but they're actually a hoverfly and they do this hovering behavior. And why do I like hoverflies so much? Because hoverflies love aphids and they will lay their eggs. You can see on this stem, 
there's some, I didn't put an arrow in, so maybe you can't see it, but there's these white larval looking things that are in, in a, between the um, aphids and those, and here's a close up of them, and those are eating aphids. So this was a big aphid patch and that happens. Sometimes you get one plant with a lot of aphids and I've actually seen quite a few hoverflies in my greenhouse. They will come in the greenhouse if you have flowers. And so I went back the next day to take a picture of it with no aphids on it. Cause literally this is three days in a row. Uh, but the funny thing is that all the hoverflies were gone too. So these are the immatures or the larvas or they're sometimes called maggots because it is a fly. And this is the stage, this long, almost whitish, you can see, they're almost clear. You can see through and see their guts. But the big thing I knew and noticed about hoverflies is that they kind of flip their head. So if they get um, scared, they'll start to flip their head. So third day, there was no hoverflies. There was no aphids. There was just nothing to take a picture of. So you don't have a picture of the third day, but it's well, interesting. But one of the easiest flowers, and you saw this in the duck photo, I try, I always grow these outside. These are the sweet alyssum. I always have them outside because there's so many thousands of flowers on each and every um, plant. But also um, in the greenhouse, this was the first year I tried them in the greenhouse and they are uh, amazing, it's all the flowers. But also if you have some things like dill, and I don't, I have some dill in my greenhouse, but not too much. They produce a lot of pollen. I'm gonna to have to move along. I see I've used most of my hour here and I haven't gotten to your questions. So make flowers available all season if you can. This is just a little, another bug that we're all very familiar with is the um, ladybug. And these are the ladybug larvae. So they are, um, I, I, th I just thought this was a funny video because they kind of pushed each other away and kind of had a little fight there. They're looking for ladybugs, but you can see they are, they're looking for aphids, but you can see they've already eaten all the aphids on this particular zinnia. So they're on their way to pupate. And here's just a picture of uh, the ladybug eggs, look small and yellow, and they look a lot like potato beetle eggs. So you, you might be worried that you have something bad. They're always on the underside of the leaves. The larva is like a baby alligator. It's kind of black with red stripes, although they're all different depending on what variety you've got. And the pupa hangs upside down on a leaf and just wanted you to not damage it. Ever since I've had a neighbor that called me over because she had so many bugs on her tree and she said, not to worry, Donna, I hired an exterminator and they've killed all the bugs. And when I went and looked at them, they were all ladybug larvae. So the ladybug larva had been eating her aphids and she didn't know it. So I'm careful now to show everybody that even if it's overkill and you've already seen that. So keep up with the, um, keep that kitchen open for the bugs, keep flowers blooming all the time. I'm able to let my kale go through the winter. So this was in March last year, uh, my kale was blooming. And sometimes bugs that we think of as pests are actually good bugs. And this is a little video of a wasp in a zinnia. And he is looking, actively looking for aphids. And I've also seen wasps on my cabbages picking up those little cabbage worms, the little green cabbage worms and eating an entire cabbage worm in one sitting. So wasps can be your friend. Just don't hang your wasp trap over your kitchen table or your outside table where you like to eat because that's where they'll go. They'll go, they'll be attracted to that. Put lots of red flowers out in your garden. They love red. Red's a favorite color of wasps. Put lots of red flowers on the edges or on the outside, and then they'll be hanging around to take care of everything. And so it's going to be tough to decide, but if I had to pick just one thing, I would pick the alyssum in my greenhouse, and I would put a couple of red flowers outside. So I also really want to emphasize that it really matters what variety you grow. And we showed that with the Golden Delight. It, it's quite different the ananas noir with the big cracking and so try to grow something that you really like here's just um i'm sorry for the people that can't see the slides we are going to try to put it on youtube or have this available otherwise but this is just a variety that i've grew this year and you can see in this picture the one called pantano romanesco it is uh, fantastic both inside my greenhouse and outside produces really well has those really nice ribbed um nice big ribbed tomatoes, a fairly large size. And you can see it almost next to the Ananas Noir in this photo and see these Ananas Noir pictures are 
And you can see the cracking and you can see that big core. And also I grew one called Aussie because Australia, everything's bigger in Australia. And Aussie was really a huge tomato. But again, no particular flavor. It was just big and had a big core. So it's not my favorite. I try to grow new ones every year. And if you want to know what my favorite is, it's that little one on the top right called Cherokee Purple. It's another one that you'll save the seeds of. It's very even inside, very luscious, very delicious, very small core. And on the other side, you'll see Juliet, which is also here. If you're able to see this screen, this is Juliet. Juliet's are, I just went out and picked a bunch. They're a miniature Roma style tomato. It's been my favorite for about six years now. So I grow it every year. But this year, I think Cherokee Purple won my heart. They're just a little bit bigger. So many peppers. I grew so many peppers this year. I grew one new thing uh, called Frizzy Grow Lettuce, which I had never grown before. Frizzy Go Lettuce. It's a very funny name. F-R-I-S-Y-G-O. And I grew it because, as you can see, I've got a picture here of just a single little stem. It looks so pretty on the, you just cut it off and you can put it on your plate. You don't have to cut it again. Each little piece grows separately. So I had these in the greenhouse because when you first put your plants in, like your tomatoes, there's always lots of room around them. And I had them in the greenhouse. I also love Veronica cauliflower, but as I said with a Suzanne, I've stopped growing it in the greenhouse because it takes up too much space. I have moved them outside and I just cover them with lens, um, with fabric like Agrabon. So grow something different. Veronica is very different. It looks like a dinosaur head. And use your space creatively. I have been growing strawberries and eaves troughs starting last year. It, it lets me use, because as you know, with our BC greenhouses, you can uh, bolt uh, anything up to the sides. You can send a bolt through, put a little um, ledge, a little bracket that will hold the eaves troughs. And we've had a lot of, a lot of strawberries, had that lovely salad. And also uh, cucumbers, I put up a little bit of structure so I could grow cucumbers and we have cucumbers outside as well. But again, like the zucchinis, it's nice to have them early. And the other creative thing maybe I do is I grow in grow bags and I have a lot of actually some strawberries and some other mixed herbs and even some dwarf tomatoes in bags that I then, when it's warmer outside, I bring those outside. But I have had some problems with insects. I wanted to show problems. And this will probably be the last year I'm going to grow my strawberries in the eaves troughs, even though it's only my second year, because I had problems with the Drosophila, the um, spotted winged Drosophila. And that lays its eggs into maturing. And this happens outside too. It's not just a greenhouse problem, but it's becoming more widespread in North America. And by focusing those plants in such a small area, the only way you can keep them out is to use very fine netting. And then I'd have to be super careful. And then it would get too hot in the greenhouse. That very fine netting doesn't let it breathe. So I'm moving, strawberries are moving outside because I didn't have that many problems outside. And also thrips really distort how the fruit looks on the strawberries. You'll see they're not evenly. And I did write about this. You can look back on the last two ago. I write a blog every month for Angela. So you can read about that the thrips distort the fruit. And if you've grown cucumbers and you've seen them curling up like this, then you have had thrips. It doesn't change the flavor, but it the plants don't look nice. Again, you don't wanna have all ugly plants. As gardeners, we accept we're gonna have some ugly plants, but the thrips really distort the fruits. And luckily there is a, a little insect that you can get called Amblusus cucumerus. So they just call it cucumerus for short. I was going to show you this video, but I think we're going to run out of time and I want to get to your questions. So the best thing with thrips, and you can see the bran on this leaf, the bran is actually how they ship the cucumerus to you. And they will, my, my leaves were perfect after I added cucumerus. So fruit. I'm not going to show that. Nicole, you can also use sticky traps that helps you to catch insects. And these are just painted and sticky. And when you peel it back, different insect stick, and then you can get out a little hand lens and check to see what you've got. And you can also use worm castings. Some types of worm castings, the ones that have not been sterilized or pasteurized, will have living cucumerous um, and livering, living um, streopsis in them, different bugs that will kill other bugs. So, ah, uh, flea beetles. Usually it's an outdoor problem and you get a lot of holes and things. But this year I actually saw on my lower leaves in my greenhouse I had some flea beetles and they just gnaw little holes and things and then they hop. They're little black bugs that hop. And so 
I put out my sticky traps kind of late. I needed those out earlier. Spider mites, uh, you probably won't see the spider mites, you'll just see the webbing. And so I always plant beans in the spring because the first thing to attract spider mites will be beans. And they're like a trap crop. You just then tear out the bean plants and put more in and you have to keep doing this. But as soon as you see that webbing, a very fine webbing that you have to look at with a hand lens, you know, that's your first sign that you've got spider mites. I, for the first time, had spider mites on my lemons, and it appeared like this, these yellow dots that were around the plant. I thought it was uh, perhaps some kind of weird nutritional problem, but it wasn't. It turned out when I turned the leaf over, and this is very small, you can see that very tiny arrow. It's the two spotted spider mites, so I had to zoom in with a, a bit of a hand lens and my phone. And so you can't really see it, but you can see two spots on that one little white bug. So you can't, don't hope to see spider mites. Just uh, when you see the, the signs, then you order in something, a bug. There is no spray that's going to do as good a job as the bug. And this is the spider mite eliminator. It is the best bug for spider mites. You might have to, um, if you have mites in your garden this summer in your greenhouse, anywhere in your greenhouse, and you think you've been washing down your greenhouse nicely and they're all gone, it's not true. They go into the soil. They go into the um, cracks and crannies between your, your pots and they'll be going down for the winter. So you have not gotten rid of them. One thing I'll tell you, I have the world's cutest dog. Every dog owner says this, Other, every grandmother says it about their grandchildren, but Corley is a, is a sweetheart, but she is not allowed in the greenhouse. Corley is like a precursor to a poodle, so she has intensely curly hair. And as a dog or even a person with a big wool coat walks through a greenhouse, you pick up you pick up the spider mites on your fur and then you move them to a new area. So Coralie can't come into the greenhouse. I'd love to have her in there, but she doesn't come in. So now we're finally getting into fall. In the fall, you're going to start to see gray mold. And that is because it gets cool in the fall. And so if it was 100% humidity when it was 25 degrees or 80 degrees in your greenhouse, as soon as the temperatures drop overnight, if you keep your fans blowing all the time, it still might be too much. Now, this isn't one of this year's pictures. This is from a few years ago, and it's a type of fungus. It's called gray mold. So the day you get your first gray mold, and I saw this morning, I thought I saw one or two leaves just starting to go off. Then I start to wholeheartedly pull out plants because I don't heat my greenhouse. If you heat your greenhouse, this is the time, the first leaf that's turning, it's the time to get your fat, make sure all the fans are blowing, make sure your heat's turned up. You want to keep that temperature high or you will get gray mold. Um, and I just remove my tomatoes as soon as I see it. Another tip is I have, it's so charming. I have some things like um, snapdragons that just pop in on their own and they grow and they bloom and they look so pretty. And last year I noticed they had a lot of aphids on them first thing in the spring. So leaving flowers over winter in your greenhouse, not a good idea because they'll overwinter pests for sure. Now it's time to start seeding and planting in your greenhouse. And of course, I love things like spinach and mustard. And these are a couple of different kinds. There's purple mustards and green mustards and fine leaf mustards and thick leaf mustard. So these are really good plants that can grow way cold into the winter. They'll cover up your soil and act like a cover crop, but they'll also just be a really nice salad uh, plant all winter. And arugula is the same. Also, when I take out um, tomatoes, it's time to seed my spinach and I just broadcast it. This year, I think I'm gonna seed it in rows because I like to be a little more in control. When you broadcast it, they don't come up quite the right area. You and I also sorry, yeah. Sorry, I'm just gonna get you to pop, pop back for a second because we've got a couple of questions here related to what you were just talking about. Okay. Um, okay. So one question was, how high do you keep the heat in the greenhouse once you start seeing mold? Well, once you start seeing it, it might be too late. You kind of have to keep the heat up the day before you see it, which is what's so tricky, right? Because okay. so fans all the time. I always have fans. That keeps the air moving because it's the humidity and the settling of the moisture on the plants. So I would be trying to have it at about um, 12 degrees at night and about 20 to 25 during the day. Okay. We also have another one here. Um, it says, I still have cherry tomatoes ripening in the greenhouse and it's slowing yeah. way, way down. Should I cut them off and bring them inside? If they're ripe or 
close to getting ripe, it's such a good time to plant your winter crops that you want to sort of, you have to juggle it. You might leave one plant in, but I still, like I just picked these yesterday. It's not like we're done with picking, but I have been taking any plants that are still blooming, but don't have fruit. Those are gone. Those ones are out like the anana store, the other big ones. Is that for that? Yeah. So there's another one and this is um, okay. a classic greenhouse question. <laughs> so, okay. um, I had temperatures in the 40 degrees Celsius range. What's the best way to regulate temperature? If you could also comment on fans and air circulation. Well, the best person is the person is, is the BC greenhouse staff. Because if you didn't order a big enough fan when you ordered your greenhouse, which happened to me, I didn't get a big enough fan because you can use those little tiny fans and they sort of move air around. And I had a tiny greenhouse before. So I used a tiny fan, just a clip on. But once you get a bigger greenhouse, you need a bigger fan. So to work out how much, it's kind of an engineering question. And so I settled on a big, uh, quite a big fan that actually runs all the time year round, even yeah. when I'm not actively growing. So you have to have a fan and you have to have it going. And I have it aimed down. So it's sort of pushing the air down because the hot air rises. So it pushes that hot air down, but it also keeps the air circulating. Um, maybe I can just comment on that. Um, okay. So there's there's a few options. So we would tell you, you know, BC Greenhouse Way, always, always, always have air circulation going in the greenhouse. Um, we have exhaust fan systems that help um, push that hot air out, bring the cool air down from the ground and up. Um, and I just have that too. I have exhaust yeah. fans. The other thing that's really kind of neat and a passive option is people have, um, we've been suggesting... Uh, installing ceiling fans into their greenhouse. So you actually place it in a bracket just above your roof vent and you Push put it and in reverse and it pulls all of that hot air up and out oh, through the roof vent. That's so creative. Why didn't we think about that? That's yeah. great. Yeah. I see all those that. ideas that come right from the fact that that's great. So in the summer, yeah, exhaust fans and, and like you say, the roof fan, that's fantastic. Um, would it be okay if I asked another question on behalf of Brian? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Brian says, um, this is going back to your spider mites thing. He says, I struggled to fight off invasions of spider mites and aphids this summer. Do they overwinter in the greenhouse and come back with a vengeance in the spring? What can I yeah. do now to start and so, a clean this slide? slide. Is answering, yeah, this slide is answering that question. See, oh, I just knew perfect. that. Question. Oh, you're so smart. <laughs> <laughs> so First of all, once you get most of your plants out, it's really good to wash off your walls of your greenhouse because that gray mold will stay in your greenhouse and just be waiting. So hydrogen peroxide, you can get a big car brush like you would use to wash your car. Also, you can install beneficial bugs around the walls, wherever you have a downspout or water thing coming up or just a wall or, and it's called, and I put the whole tag on here because it's such a long name. In the industry, they just call it SS, Stradiolaplaps shimit. I can't even say this word. You have to write it down. S T R A T I O L A E L A P S. That's the Latin name. Simitus is the the genus or the species name. S C I M I T U S. It's a predatory mite. It used to have a really easy name, and you might still still see it listed under the easy name. The easy name is Hypoaspis miles. The last name is miles, like not kilometers, but miles. And so these are the same bug. And so different places will list this at different times. And this is the time of year today, tomorrow, go online. If you're in the US, some of you are in the US and some are in Canada, just go online and order beneficial bugs. And this predatory mite gets into the soil and then it crawls down because people think their spider mites are gone. They're like, hey, wow, well that September 21st day when it was the first day of fall, they start to know that the days are shorter and they go into the soil, into the cracks, into the crannies, they're hiding. Aphids are often hiding on plants like that. Um, you leave some pretty plants in your greenhouse because it just seems so nice, like things in pots or things that are pretty. And they're often overwintering on those. So I would say to you that the biggest thing to do is to get the predatory mite because then in the spring, they've been eating all winter. They've been eating the spider mites all winter. 
And so you may still have some mites in the spring. You may have to apply one more time or the persimilis that I just showed. Uh, persimilis is the most common summer maintenance program, but this predatory mite eats all winter. Does that answer that question? I also found out by accident that some types of worm castings have this hypoaspis miles. I'm going to use the easy name now that you've written down the uh, Latin name, the SS. And so if you can buy worm castings that have not been, and this is just one name of one brand, but I'm sure there's lots of brands, ask if they've been um, sterilized or or you know, in any way heated to kill the organisms in them. If they have, don't buy it. But if you can buy, either use your own worm castings from your own compost or buy something like the Earthly Matters, they have actually had theirs tested and they have this hypoaspis miles. So now, because they actually don't just eat mites, they eat fungus gnats. What's more irritating than fungus gnats? So all of my house plants now have, I'm talking just a quarter inch on all of my house plants of worm castings because they go into the soil and they eat the fungus gnat larvae that are in the soil. I'm just in heaven. I have been asked this question so many times and finding the last, and this is all covered on the um, podcast where I interview Dan from Earthly Matters. And he's looking for people to, if you want a job or you have kids that need jobs, we need more people to raise quality earthworms. So go for it. Okay, the biggest benefit is that we, we eat well, and that was the whole big thing. And you don't want to be eating bugs, but sometimes you might be eating bugs. So that's just a little pasta salad with kale. And I, year round, I have salads, 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 salads. Right now, we're having squash in our salads and hazelnuts. So I, I'm hoping I'm ending on time. Yes, we still have time for more questions, too. So I just wanted to show this little video of why we do what we do in our greenhouse. pepper going on to arugula going on to tomatoes for those of you that are watching on your phone and then just a big piece of toast we make fantastic sandwiches and that's my last slide that's why we do it mm -hmm. so questions do we have more questions angela yeah there's a, a question about uh, shade cloth so maybe you can um talk about when you what uh, what time of year you apply and, and remove Again, as the gardener, it's your job to pay attention. I didn't know there was a heat wave coming. I didn't know we were going for that. I didn't know. But I know that in my garden, it usually starts to get hot in July. And I don't want to wait till the July 1st long weekend. I want to do it earlier. So I pick a day in June. So in my garden, again, at my latitude, close to 50, it gets hot in July and August. You might get hot on May 1st. You might get hot earlier. So you don't want to put it up. It's tricky. You don't want to put it up too early. There's 40. Um, shades 40 and 50 and 60. There's different kinds of shade cloth. I decided to use it the least amount of time because I want to have the most growing until you put on the shade cloth and then it blocks that much sunlight. And when you block the sunlight, honestly, there were times this summer where it was cooler in the greenhouse because of the shade cloth. So I usually put it on in June. No right or wrong there. Um, there's a question here from Brian. Asking, should I thin out the eaves trough strawberries during the winter for spacing? No. Um, is do you know where Brian lives? Brian, where do you live? <laughs> you know, because I. Yeah, I live in uh, Vancouver area, BC. Oh, okay. Then just leave them, but get some of that SS or the hypoaspis miles or the worm castings. And because you're going to have spider mites over, I found this out by accident second year, you're going to have spider mites over wintering in there. They're looking for a place to go. So don't thin them out yet because when the plants get big, what I've been doing, and you'll maybe have to do it next year, is you can cut back the suckers when they grow. And that um, I need to escape here so that Angela gets control again. Oh, I did I'm it already. <laughs> okay, there we go. So yeah. Yeah, you're going to want to leave them because it's better to have more with strawberries. The bigger the plant, the more berries you'll get. If they're really tight, yeah, you could thin a few out. But yeah, make sure to get some SS in there, hypoaspis miles. Okay, folks, do we have any last questions that we would like answered before we uh, sign off? I like Marianne's uh, greenhouse. I want to know what she's growing in her greenhouse. Everything's in pots. 
Or do you have some soil? Oh, your microphone, Marianne. She has pods. Okay. There we go. Nice. So you might want to get some worm castings if they haven't been pasteurized and sprinkle them on the top of all your pots because you're going to have spider mites in your pots. I have that. Just I have hmm? them on my, my lemon tree and my greenhouse is only a month old. So I'm a newbie with this. So yeah, thanks for so, doing this video. This, um, uh, was it helpful? Yes, it was. Good. So get that right now. Everybody just don't even cut corners. Either get the expensive, people are like, those are such expensive worm castings. I'm like, I know, I'll make your own or buy the nice ones that have the bugs in them or get that biological. Yeah. And it's available. We have a place called Nick Natural Insect Control. They ship it. But there's, if you Google it, there are uh, tons of things come up. Don't let them sell you the summer ones, the persimilis. Don't want that. You want the winter ones, the SS. Great. Um, there's another question here. Um, I grew a lot of tomato leaves and tall stems, but not so many tomatoes. Why? Might have been too hot. Um, we did an article on that in July. So go back and read your old blog posts. Um, Angela hosts this. It's such a good service, Angela. Thank you. So when it's too hot, the some of the varieties, the flowers just abort. They're like, if it's more than 90 degrees, they just can't produce tomatoes. They just, they abort. And uh, then you just get leaves. But most likely too much nitrogen. People love nitrogen. This is one of my favorite fertilizers. Angela and I have talked about this. It's 12535 bloom and fruit. One, one is the nitrogen. Usually by these 20, 2020s, so much leaf, so much activity. This is only sold on Amazon. We were trying to figure out if we could um, house brand it for, for BC Greenhouse clients, but it's only sold on Amazon. I like it because you can also spray it on it. The Ferticare is the brand name. You can also spray it on the leaves. You don't have to. When I came home last August after being away for a week, things looked horrible, but it, everything came back to life. So you can spray it on your leaves. I want to just show you a little tomato. This is a little tomato called a house tomato that I just started in June and in the house, it's got its first little tomato. So I'm finishing up in the greenhouse but I've got two of these in the house. <laughs> if anybody, um, maybe if there's 100 people, I won't be able to do it. But if there's like 10 people that want seeds for this, I've been saving the seeds. So you can get a hold of me through Angela and I can send you some seeds. You grow it in the house. So when you're finished with your greenhouse tomatoes out there, it takes about four months. And that's why I started them in June. So they'd be ready for Thanksgiving. Because I'm going to and I do that kind of thing. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, there's a question here from Patrick. So he actually has um, a large uh, 15 by 20 greenhouse for a school. So he's asking, oh, I know he's asking about heating it for winter. So the students are comfortable and keeping plants over winter. Now, if you're going to try to grow plants over winter, we and that's why I asked you all at the beginning to look up your latitude to see where you're at to see when you get to that 10 hour number. Because when you've got low light, less than 10 hours, really hard to grow tomatoes. Even if you're heating it, even if you're, you know, keeping your fans growing, they need light to grow. So you then have to invest in lights. And that's another investment. So again, I think your best heating information is right out of the BC Greenhouse, your webpage, Angela. You've got all that information yeah. about the heating system. So that, because you want those heaters that are going to be in the ground, I've got a heater that um, is a frost protection heater because I'm only looking at arugula and broccoli and spinach. I'm only looking at things. So it only turns on when there's going to be frost. But with kids in the classroom, again, kids don't want to wear their woolly coats. It's going to be tricky. Um, get every, you know, you need microscopes. This could be so much fun for the kids. Actually, you can tell them to email me separately, Angela. That's fine. Yeah. So I just wanted to say, Patrick, one of the things we would ask is what's your glazing? So glazing will tell us how much heat loss you're going to experience in the greenhouse. Um, you know, we have choices of electric heaters if you're in a warmer climate, climate but probably natural gas or propane is going to be your best bet. And we have these funky heating calculators that will tell us uh, what temperature you want to maintain inside the greenhouse. Um, See, they got it all. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it really is dependent on the glazing size of the greenhouse and your coldest nighttime temperature. So um, 
our staff, uh, we have some unbelievable experts there, so we can certainly support you in that. So I'm kind of the plant person, but all those other technical things, yeah, you can get some good support that way. And then there's a question here, where, you, where are you buying your predatory mites? Well, I buy mine from Applied Bionomics and they ship across North America, but they don't want to ship one little thing to Texas or something. So I did a quick Google search and I saw that Natural Insect Controls, NIC is their acronym. They're in Ontario. They buy from Applied Bionomics in bulk and then reship them. There's also companies like Copert, K-O-P-P-E-R-T. They're out of Holland and they ship them. Um, I've also seen other companies in the States, quite a few biological controls. So just Google biological controls. And these are common things. Like I said, that one SS might also be called hypoaspis, depending on who you're dealing with, but um, they're available everywhere. They have been usually based on things that were found out in fields. And now what did Brian tell me? The mint growers outdoors in Montana that are growing organic mint, had so many mites on this summer, spider mites outside, and they brought in their, their persimilis and they were fine. So there's a different solution. Their webpage, look at their webpage, Applied Bionomics. Even if you don't order from them, you really should order from somebody closer to you. They just happen to be very close to me in Victoria. But Applied Bionomics, you put in the pest like spider mites, they have really good videos, really good information. You'll be all topped up on the education and then just order them from wherever you can get them. Is that, is that good enough? Yeah, that's great. I just wanted to say, so what I did last time when I um, sent out the recording of the Zoom, um, I also sent out um, a whole bunch of support links and um, I got really great, great feedback on that. People were, seemed to really support that. Um, and so a couple of things to know, like BC Greenhouse, we have a blog. Um, Donna contributes to that regularly, which is incredible. Um, you also have an amazing newsletter. So I would strongly encourage people to sign up for your newsletter. Um, Thank you. Not to mention your podcast and all of these, you know, as well as your books. My goodness, you're like a, obviously you're an incredible resource. So, um, we would really uh, encourage people to like, keep like, keep connecting with us. If you have questions, um, we're here and um, we're really going to try and do a workshop each spring and fall and um we'll get better and better at it as time goes on <laughs> the last um, time i didn't have enough slides this time too many you see yeah <laughs> that's okay <laughs> so i think probably what we'll do is um if there aren't any last burning questions um we may just um end it here and invite everyone to have a wonderful weekend and thank you donna um, okay thank you yeah. so much have fun growing okay bye for now Take care.